Events in the world are governed by laws of probability, but our brains are prone to probability illusions that cause us to make mistakes. Sometimes these mistakes are costly. At the end of this video, I'll tell you about a $2 billion mistake. In the previous set of videos, I showed how we are prone to errors when reasoning about coincidences, and I talked about the gambler's fallacy. In this video, we're going to talk about the small sample fallacy. Here's an interesting fact. When you look at the incidence of kidney cancer among the 3,143 counties across the United States, you'll find that the counties that have the lowest incidence of kidney cancer are mostly rural, sparsely populated, and located in traditionally Republican states in the Midwest, the South, and the West. Now, why is it that these counties have the lowest incidence of kidney cancer? It's not hard to imagine a possible explanation. Maybe rural areas or the rural lifestyle makes it less likely to contract cancer. Maybe there's less air pollution or water pollution. Maybe there's more access to fresh foods with fewer chemical additives. And maybe this is what accounts for the low rate of kidney cancer. Now, let me ask you another question. Where do you think you'll find the counties with the highest incidence of kidney cancer in the United States? And here's the answer. The counties with the highest incidence of kidney cancer are mostly rural, sparsely populated, and located in traditionally Republican states in the Midwest, the South, and the West. Now, wait a minute. How is this possible? How can the incidence of kidney cancer be both highest and lowest in the same regions of the country? Now, that's an interesting question. But before we get to that, ask yourself this. If I had told you the second fact first, that the highest incidences of kidney cancer are in these regions, and asked you to speculate about a possible explanation for this fact, would you have had a hard time coming up with one? I doubt it. People are very good at this kind of explanatory thinking. You might think, for example, that the incidence of kidney cancer is correlated with poverty and the rural lifestyle. In rural areas, you might have less access to good medical care, a higher fat diet, maybe people drink more alcohol and smoke more tobacco. And all of these add up to making people more susceptible to kidney cancer than people in more urban areas. Now, I want to underline that what we just did there is something that human beings are very good at. When we're given some data, some pieces of information, we naturally try to make sense of it by imagining a causal story, a causal narrative, which if true, would generate and thereby explain the data that we have. Human beings are awesome at this kind of causal explanatory thinking. It lies at the root of some of our most sophisticated and distinctively human kinds of thinking. However, it can lead us astray. We'll get into trouble if we fail to realize that the data we're given is, in fact, a statistical artifact, a product of random chance. If you try to give a causal explanation for events that are a product of random chance, you're going to make a mistake because you're trying to attribute a cause to something that by its nature has no cause. Now let's get back to the kidney cancer statistics. How is it possible for the same group of counties to have both the highest and the lowest rates of kidney cancer in the United States? The key factor is not that they're rural or that they're predominantly Republican. The key factor is that they're sparsely populated. They have small populations. And small populations are going to show greater extremes in terms of deviations from the population mean than larger populations. Let's use a simple example to explain this. You've got a big jar of marbles. Half the marbles are red and half are green, but they're all mixed up. This is the population. And in terms of color, the population mean is 50% red and 50% green. Now, when I reach in and randomly draw out a set of marbles, I'm sampling from this population. Now, imagine that I only draw out four marbles at a time. The distribution of colors in the sample is going to vary. Sometimes I'll get two reds and two greens, which matches the actual population mean, but other times I'll get three of one color or four of one color. Three of one color is a deviation from the population mean, but four of one color is a more extreme deviation. It's 100% red or 100% green. Now, with a sample size of four, extreme outcomes will be fairly common. In this case, the expected frequency of getting all four marbles the same color is 12.5%. So almost 13 times out of 100 draws, you can expect to get this extreme outcome. And you can expect half of these extreme outcomes to be all red and half to be all green. Now, if I increase the sample size, this will have a dramatic effect on the frequency of these extreme outcomes. Imagine drawing seven marbles at once. Now you have a wider range of possible outcomes, 
how often do you think you'll draw all seven marbles with the same color? Well, the answer is 1.56%. So less than two times in 100 draws will you expect to get all reds or all greens. This is an example of a general result. With smaller samples, you'll have more variation in the sample means. With larger samples, you'll have less variation. Now we can use this example to shed light on the kidney cancer result. Imagine that the United States is a giant jar with each person represented by a marble in the jar. Each incidence of kidney cancer is a different colored marble. Let's say that all incidences of kidney cancer are marked blue, while the remaining marbles are white. Sampling involves reaching inside the jar and randomly pulling out a marble. You fill up each county by population size. So for the smallest counties, you might draw only a few hundred or a few thousand marbles from the jar. But for the larger counties, you'll be drawing tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands of marbles from the jar. It follows then that the less populated counties are more likely to see extreme outcomes. They're more likely to register both the lowest rates of kidney cancer, that is a higher percentage of white marbles, and the highest rates of kidney cancer, that is a higher percentage of blue marbles. Of course, the same county won't register both a high and a low rate of kidney cancer on the same survey. But if you come back to the same county year after year, you may easily find that the same county has above average rates of kidney cancer one year and below average rates another year. And here's the point. In these counties showing extreme sample results, there is no causal story to tell about why the incidences of kidney cancer are unusually high one year and unusually low another. The variation is a statistical artifact of the small sample size. It would be a mistake to assume that there must be an explanation in terms of lifestyle or environment or some other causal factor. And that's the essence of what I'm calling the small sample fallacy. It's the mistake of interpreting a statistical result as requiring a causal explanation when the result is merely a statistical artifact generated by small sample sizes. Here's another interesting example. During World War II, London was bombed heavily by the Germans. What we now call the London Blitz was an intense bombing period over about eight months between 1940 and 1941. Now at the time it was widely believed that the bombing could not be random because a map of the hits revealed gaps, which led many people to speculate that German spies were located in the unharmed areas and the Germans were deliberately avoiding those areas to protect their spies. But a statistical analysis of the bombing patterns reveals that the gaps are precisely what you would predict if the bombing was purely random. Random processes are not uniform. They show predictable clustering that is built into the structure of randomness itself. Now I said at the start I would give an example of a costly mistake involving small sample effects. So here it is. The Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation has invested a great deal of money into education and education research in recent years. One of their investments was in response to a study that indicated that the most successful schools tend to be small. Now this is part of a larger body of work that was trying to identify the most successful schools and figure out what it was about them that explained their success with the hope that we could replicate what they're doing right. So what might account for the success of smaller schools? Well, maybe the smaller schools allow for more personal attention from teachers or a stronger sense of community. Now we're good at thinking up possible explanations like these. It's not that hard to do. This line of thinking motivated the Gates Foundation to invest almost $2 billion in the creation of smaller schools and the reorganization of larger schools into smaller units. A number of other private and federal institutions participated in this massive project. And all of this was predicated on the belief that the smallness of schools was a causal factor in explaining the above average success of smaller schools. Now, can you see where this is going? Are you getting a bit of a sinking feeling in your stomach? Because you should. The truth is that the worst performing schools also tend to be the smallest. Now let me repeat, the smaller schools include both the worst and the best performing schools. It's just like the kidney cancer example. You expect to find the greatest deviations from the statistical norm within the smallest samples. So this whole education project overlooked the possibility that the result they were getting might be a statistical artifact of a random sampling procedure. This failure to recognize small sampling effects for what they are, and our tendency to want to give causal explanations for these effects, and to act on the basis of such explanations, is part of what I'm calling the small sample fallacy. 
Now, the statistical methods for detecting small sample effects are not that complicated, but the trick is to get people to be on the lookout for them in the first place. And this is something that we're just not naturally inclined to do. For those interested, each of the examples discussed in this video can be found in Chapter 10 of Daniel Kahneman's book, Thinking Fast and Slow. The original work that discusses the kidney cancer in smaller schools examples is from Weiner and Zwirling's work, and I have the reference here. And if you want to take a look at German bombing patterns on London during World War II, check out bombsite.org.